All right, it's going to be my honor to introduce John Stoughton. John is a longtime resident of Summit. I met John when we were both JCs in Summit. Because of our time there, I joined the first A squad and spent 20 years, and I was able to work with John at the Summit squad. John joined the Summit Final Test squad in 1983. Well, here is 40 years later. A, he's an EMT riding 12 hour shifts on Mondays and responding to backup calls. John has been a very active member of the squad with the volunteer hours exceeding the minimum of 48 hours per month. John has served as captain, chief, president, and trustee, as well as serving on many, many committees. I've had an opportunity to respond with emergencies with John and observe to provide he has excellent patient care and comfort, comfort not only the patient, but also the family. John has been a true asset to the Summit Volunteer First Aid Squad. John is a competent leader, recently given himself other and continue to be a vital part of the organization. In night. In 2023, he received the Overlook EMT Excellency Award. He's the Director, Governor, Security Officer at at t where he manages operation personnel and information security, as well as the company Insight Threat Program. I'm sure after his presentation, we will all appreciate the people who serve with the local EMS. Don? You know, I, I like to wander around the room, so I'll, I'll try to stay uh, tethered here. Uh, September uh, happens to be Summit Volunteer First Aid Squad Month, for those of you who live in Summit. So happy to be in this building in New Providence. Uh, spent a lot of time in this building. Uh, in fact, tonight I'll probably be back here because uh, the scout troop for which I'm an assistant scoutmaster meets in this very building. And uh, my son had his Eagle Scout ceremony uh, in this very room. So happy to be back here. So. Um, He's off in college now, so I'm transitioning from uh, assistant scout master to Eagle Scout coach. So uh, I, in case there's a couple of scouts in the room. Um, heard a lot about the old guard over the years. My dad was a member years ago. I see a few familiar faces in the room. Uh, fortunately, I don't see any who I've seen on a professional basis uh, in from first aid squad. That's a good thing. Um, so uh, the, the mayor did uh, proclaim just last week. September is First Aid Squad Month and Summit, and we do that because that's the month where we launch our annual fund drive. I'm not here to um, pitch for, for money. Um, you know, there are three things that are important to any volunteer organization, as you folks probably know, right? The three M's, as I call them, you know, money, members, and motivation. So my job is usually to go out and pitch for members. You know, I realize you may not be our target market, although some of you might be. We, we actually had a, a fellow who retired from active duty at age 85, um, so that's a possibility, but you know, well, like, like the Marines always say, we want a few good men. Uh, we get the first aid squad. We want more than that. We want your women. We want your young. So uh, we'll take them all. Okay. So, well, uh, first aid squad has been around since 1962. Um, you know, um, we are, uh, what a lot of people don't realize is we are a completely independent nonprofit corporation. We're not part of the city of summit. Uh, we don't receive any tax dollars. We're staffed uh, since 1962. We've been staffed entirely by volunteers and we're funded solely through private contributions. Uh, that nice new building that we built um, and cut the ribbon on in 2015, we raised uh, almost $5 million privately, didn't use a dime of city money. Uh, and we like it that way because that means, um, you know, we, we don't have to, you know, follow the, the, uh, the rule of law of some of the bureaucrats that would uh, otherwise do that. Uh, and then New Providence here has a good first aid squad as well. They're building, the city did build, Al Morgan gave them that building, uh, but they're also uh, all fully volunteer um, and they do raise money privately as well. Uh, in Summit, we are the official EMS agency of the city of Summit. So it's, uh, you know, there are some misnomers. Oh, sometimes the hospital responds with their ambulance and it's always us. Um, you might get some paramedics, you know, to respond as well, depending on the nature of the call. Uh, about 10 to 15 percent of our calls, in addition to our ambulance, you'll also get a paramedic unit, usually from Atlantic Health, uh, primarily Overlook Medical Center. I still say Overlook Hospital, because you know, but uh, or sometimes Morristown, sometimes St. Barnabas. Um, 
or now Robert Wood Johnson, St. Barnabas, right? Um, so uh, we are uh, go- self-governed. We are uh, we have a board of trustees and officers elected from among the members. Okay, um, I've had the, uh, the pleasure or or sometimes a headache of serving as chief and president each five times over the years. So um, not con- not contiguously. Thank, thank goodness. Okay, uh, I was chief last year. Uh, I stepped down this year because I had some more responsibility at work. Uh, what does the first aid squad do? Um, number one, I highlighted it, you know, 24 hour emergency medical service. Uh, I answered my last EMS call, got home at about 3.30 this morning. So if I yawn, you know, that's why. Monday nights is my normal duty night. And we do also provide as available non-emergency transportation to Summit residents. Um, and then some of the things we're doing here today, uh, community outreach. So, you know, coverage at community events where we provide ambulance coverage community education, healthy and safe topics, health and safety topics. I'll talk about a little bit that more today. We have some health and safety awareness projects I'll talk about. And uh, we do give lectures and demonstrations to local groups. And at the end, I'll talk a little bit about personal safety as well. Um, Like I said, we built our new building on Summit Avenue uh, in 2015. It was originally built in 1963. um, And we, uh, we tore it down in 2014 moved into a temporary headquarters for a year that uh, that ship Salerno from Salerno Dwayne was uh, was uh, nice enough to give us um, Chip Dwayne I'm sorry from Salerno Dwayne uh, fellow Villanova guy I shouldn't get his name wrong um, we operate three identically equipped ambulances we have a first responder vehicle that we also use uh, for incident command and fire scene support and some other things uh, some some of us will take that home at night and respond directly to the scene um, we, you know, we try to keep as best as we can up to date with, with supplies. The things that we had, you know, in terms of rescue supplies and equipment in 1983 when I joined uh, versus what we have today are almost unrecognizable. Um, you know, Tom has seen some of that change, too, that happened over the years. Uh, we conduct regular training for our members. We are an approved uh, EMT program training site, so we can actually teach the state emergency medical technician program in our building. We've done it twice since the new building was built. I believe we're going to do it again next year. Uh, we typically operate in crews of at least two, usually three, uh, as many as five on a crew. Uh, we don't ever want to put somebody on the ambulance, you know, without another trained person with them. Um, some of our shifts have more than that, and we'll, we'll cover two ambulances. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit as well. Uh, most of our members spend their time in the building. Um, in the old building, we didn't have sleeping quarters, so we didn't s- typically sleep there uh, during the night shift. Um, but uh, if there was bad weather, we would, you know, bunk on some couches or have some inflatable beds and so forth. The new building actually has a, a boys and a girls dorm. Um, no pole to slide down like the firehouse, but, uh, you know, still, I'm going to, the new firehouse doesn't have a pole either. I'm going to miss that. Um, but, you know, some of our members do still respond from work or home. Um, we, when we're off duty, we do carry a pager or radio with us and we can respond to calls when available. Uh, if the duty crew is out on a call and there's another call, we call that a backup call. I think Tom mentioned that in his intro, uh, you know, calls and duty crews out on a call. There's a second call in town. They'll put, they'll page out for off duty members who are available to come in, grab another ambulance and go take that call. That happens a lot. Uh, if sometimes we'll also handle what's called mutual aid. New Providence's crew was out on a call. Somebody in this building has a medical emergency, and the New Providence crew is tied up over at you know Spring Grove or the high school or wherever. They'll call in a, in a neighboring town to come in. So sometimes you'll see another town's ambulance. That's why we do a lot of that. We had a case on Friday where um, Milburn was in Summit taking a call, uh, and at the same time Summit was in Milburn taking a call because our crew had freed up. Milburn wasn't there to take their call at the mall because they were covering our call and summit. So our crew shot over to the mall and took, actually we end up sending two ambulances to that one. Uh, so that happens sometimes. Okay. Now there's our new building. Um, much nicer than the brutal modern building we had that was built back in the sixties. Um, houses uh, six vehicles. The old building didn't actually fit all the uh, rolling stock that we had. That's one of the reasons we moved on. Uh, this is something we added a uh, number of years ago, actually following September 11th. Uh, this is our rehab uh, trailer, uh, which is basically a rolling closet of equipment. We can take that to a major incident rather than have to load up the ambulance manually. And then that ambulance can't be used for a patient until you unload it. So we can drop that trailer of a scene and use it. Uh, that's our older first response vehicle. We just replaced it with a 
with a newer one. That was from 2005. Uh, we were the first um, fire uh, rehab team in Union County uh, with that unit. There are others now too. And, and fire rehab is if you ever have a large incident, um, typically a large fire, but it could be a hazmat incident or, or a very large evacuation or something where there's heat stress. Uh, we provide on-scene support to the responders uh, so that they're not passing out from heat exhaustion. Um, so uh, we have been called to almost every town in Union County to provide that support. Okay. Uh, you know, we can talk about money and equipment and buildings, but really people at the end of the day are our most important asset. Um, that's not going to change because with all the money in the world, with a nice new shiny ambulance, if we don't have the people to staff it. You know, it's, the system's not going to work. So we uh, we currently have uh, about 60 active members on the roster. I have to update that. Uh, somebody just recently retired. Uh, uh, we lose an average of about five members a year. Uh, so far, we've lost six this year. So we're a little, little bit behind the eight ball. So um, I'm hoping to get 10 new members by beginning of next year to help fill some of the gap. Um, a lot of things that I've seen change over the years is, you know, back in the when the before my time, when the squad started, a lot of women covered the day crews and typically it was men at night. And then as the 80s rolled in, the 90s, you know, an awful lot of women work as well. So we have a pretty much a mix of members during the day. We have, you know, some retirees. We have some self-employed people. My first two years on the squad, I own my own business. So instead of, you know, my partner worked Saturdays. Um, I'm sorry, my partner, my partner took off Saturdays. I took off Wednesdays and I pulled Wednesdays on the squad, did that for two years until I got a real job with corporate America. And, you know, that was the end of that. Uh, so we have a lot of that. Uh, we have a mix of, you know, old and young. Uh, we have a mix of, you know, pretty much every profession you can think of, you know, from attorneys, uh, from business executives, you know, CPAs, you know, letter carriers, electricians, plumbers, students, you name it. We've got um, a lot of them. Um, so not everybody has the time they can give um, that they did, you know, years ago, but we find ways to make it work. A little bit about some of the services, you know, the demand for our services. I, I sort of plotted a number of years here, and you can see there's a steady increase of our services over the years, going all the way back to 1993, which was, uh, I think that was the first time I was captain back then, or uh, chief. Uh, you'll notice there's a bit of a dip right here in 2020. I call that the COVID dip. Um, in 2019, we had a little bit of a drop in our annual call volume. Um, Spring Meadow, the uh, nursing home in Summit, uh, nursing home, the assisted living facility in Summit, closed that year. So surprisingly, we saw a drop in a little, little bit, slight drop in calls. Beginning of 2020, we had a very large spike in calls because COVID happened. And so, in the months of you know, the end of February, March, April, huge, huge spike in calls. Uh, by June, we had a, calls took a nosedive because every, anybody remembers what happened is, you know, end of May, June, July, August, nobody went to the doctor anymore. Nobody wanted to go to the hospital. Nobody wanted to set foot inside a CVS or a Walgreens, right? Because who goes to CVS or Walgreens? Sick people, right? So, you know, so nobody wanted to do so. And we noticed it too. People weren't calling 911. Huge drop. So there was the first time, that was what I call the COVID dip. OK, uh, by 2021, that changed. We once again, you know, um, call volume went back up again. Uh, again, in 2022, the, the highest number of calls we ever had in our 60 year history. Um, and now in 2023, um, in 2022, a, a new assisted living facility in Summit opened. And in 2023, what was Spring Meadow, which now Brandywine is back. So we'll probably see those numbers go up again. Uh, as we do. So that's a little bit of a timeline. Okay. Um, here's our team as of, as we celebrate our 60th anniversary last year. Uh, that's the, uh, our, most of our volunteers and three of our ambulances. So that's my little pitch. So if you know somebody who's interested in joining the squad, um, anybody 16 years or older is eligible to be a member. Um, 18 years and older is a, is a senior member. Um, you know, we do uh, have a pretty effective junior program. About 15% of our junior members come back after they uh, graduate high school. Uh, we have had uh, at least three presidents of the squad over the years who started their career as, as junior members. And we've had two um, chiefs over the years who started 
as their career as junior members. We've had a number of uh, members who, um, a parent and a, and a child also close to me. Tom had two of his daughters who were members of the squad. Not a lot of activities where you can do the same activity as your teenage child and actually both enjoy doing it. So that, that's one of the few. You know, scouting might be one. I'll, I'll, I'll give Mitch a nod there. So, you know. Um, okay. Uh, we also have affiliate members, folks who don't ride the ambulance, but provide, you know, um, administrative support, uh, you know, finance, um, you know, you know, fundraising, finance, publicity, uh, building and grounds, things like that. Um, so anyway, we don't require experience. We, we train. Um, you know, what I tell people all the time is if they're interested in being a squad member, or afraid to be a squad member, oh, oh, there's blood. I don't like blood. And I always ask, are you a parent? Particularly, do you have boys? You, you've probably already seen more blood than you will as a member of the first aid squad. Okay. Uh, particularly if they play sports, you know, or, you know, or like to climb trees or whatever. I've probably seen as much in a scout camp as I, as I have, you know, in the field. Um, so um, I'll, I'll share with Mitch my story about Sabatis and the siren after this is all over. Okay. Um, you know, you do learn valuable skills. You might use those skills to save a life. We've had a number of members who have, not when they're on duty, used their skills elsewhere uh, and, and made a difference. Uh, in fact, one of the reasons we, one of our missions is we go out and we teach to the public, you know, CPR and basic first aid, because uh, if there is a serious, you know, illness or injury and somebody with a little bit of training on scene starts, uh, the chance of that person's survival are much, much better. Um, you know, we now push bystander CPR and their AEDs pretty regularly. I know there's, there's two in this building. Um, when someone use, uses one of those or starts CPR before we get there, the survival rate increases dramatically. Um, we actually instituted something a few years ago called high performance CPR, where there's, there's no such thing as one or two person CPR anymore. It's now five person CPR. Uh, because we have a whole team rotating through doing different tasks. And what we noticed was we increased the save rate by 30% when we put that uh, that in place. So uh, that all helps. Uh, where do we, you know, we still make house calls. Um, you know, uh, most of our calls, the, the largest single number are in the patient's home or apartment. About 40% of our calls are there. Um, you know, they're also, uh, believe it or not, we get a lot of calls, you know, um, in physician's offices your health provider offices could be a physician, could be a, you know, a social worker, could be a dentist. Uh, we get a lot of those. We get uh, a couple of calls every month on the grounds of Overlook Medical Center, believe it or not, uh, at least two or three a month. Uh, if someone has a fall inside the hospital, they'll take care of it. If they have a fall outside the front door in the parking lot at the curb in the parking garage, they call us. Uh, so uh, we actually get, so if you see that, here's an example of, this was July, just an example of where our calls were. You can see 66 in a, in a patient's home, uh, 22 were on a street or a highway. So that could be a car accident or that could be somebody who was pulled over maybe by a police officer and had a case of what I call um, incarceritis, right? Um, you know, and decides, oh, you know, I have chest pain. Or I'm not feeling, or they get, you know, a panic attack. Um, or they've just pulled over the side of the road because they feel lightheaded. By the way, during COVID, anybody wear an N95 mask during COVID? I mean, I did, you know. Um, I, probably, I probably treated at least two dozen patients who had COVID before there was a vaccine uh, or anything. And I didn't get it because, you know, and none of us did because we wore an N95 mask in every call. We wore gloves and we cleaned up properly after every call. So none of our members got COVID. Um, so anyway, there was a case, though, where the fellow was wearing an N95 mask and driving his car. Okay, and he drove for about an hour, an hour and a half. You know, it does restrict breathing. He eventually passed out and drove off the road. So, you know, so that, that was that would have been one of those, you know. Okay, so you can see where, you know, bars and restaurants, you know, uh, we own, there's only one behavioral health facility in Summit, so you can probably guess which one that is. We get a lot of calls there. Um, you know, there were a couple last month at Overlook, you know. Um, so that's, so, you know, it was July, so we only had one at a private swimming pool. That was actually pretty low. So that's kind of where our calls are. They're all, all over the place. Um, can happen anywhere. Okay. Um, we typically see a summit police officer also dispatched to all of our calls, uh, at least one. Um, and I mentioned we also, for more serious emergencies, will also get paramedics, usually from usually out of Overlook. Um, 
you know, if it's a car accident or there's any kind of extrication needed or any kind of hazardous materials, Summit Fire will also respond with us. Uh, we generally request them on every highway call because uh, they'll bring a, you know, a large piece of apparatus, much bigger than ours, and they'll, they'll do something called a block. You know, they'll park behind us at an angle so that, you know, if somebody isn't paying attention and, you know, drives onto the shoulder, they'll hit that big, you know, 20 ton truck, not our ambulance. Uh, uh, and, you know, they, uh, you may have, if you live in Summit, you may have noticed an old fire engine responding for the last year, that old number 96. That's because their brand new truck was only in service for three months and on Route 24, somebody hit it. So, uh, you know, $300,000 fire truck uh, was out of service for six months getting repaired. Um, okay. Uh, I've, I found the squad a great experience. It's a great way to meet a lot of people. Um I've done other volunteer activities in Summit. I've been appointed to city boards and commissions by each of the last five mayors, Republicans and Democrats. And, and, and the reason is because they knew me because I was on the first aid squad. Um, so, you know, not that I ever want to be a politician, but if you ever want to get more involved in your town, this is a, it's a great way to do it. Uh, some people who have moved into town and are new to town and had some experience joined as a way to get to meet people. Uh, and it works pretty well. Okay, I've lived here all my life, so I didn't need that. We have had 14 marriages uh, in the squad's career of, of people who met and got married on the squads. Uh, 12 of them, um, you know, stayed married <laughs> for a long period of time. I used to actually, I used to have on there, you know, and no divorces. You know, well, we've, since we've had a couple, but but the, still, the odds are pretty good. That's we're much better than the than the national average there. Okay, uh, I mentioned that we do offer the EMT program in our building. Um, I talked about, you know, we have, you know, a number of members who we've had some members who joined because their children were members. And then um, the parent joined later. Somebody on my crew, Fred Schwarzman, uh, his son and daughter were members. He, after September 11th, he showed up. Hey, how can I help? Uh, 21 years later, he's still a member with us. So, you know, we have a lot of that. Um, yeah, I'll talk a little bit about September 11th, too, because yesterday, as you know, was the, the anniversary of that day, uh, Patriots Day. I don't say we celebrate Patriots Day because it's not really a cause to celebrate, um, but we uh, we should recognize it. Um, a couple of other, other benefits being a squad member, we have discounts at local businesses. I think here in New Providence, they have the same deal. Uh, you, any any volunteer squad or fire department member can get discounts at community college if you want to take a class. So those are all things to tell you know people who might be interested. Uh, a little bit about the Summit Squad specifically. Back in 1992, we started the very first EMS bike team. Um, the captain at the time, some young upstart guy, decided, hey, you know, um, while wh we're covering the Overlook Hustle, do we really just want to have an ambulance at the start-finish line? What, what else can we do? Because it's a long, spread-out event. And we were, a bunch of us were in line, you know, to go to the movie theater, the then movie theater in Milburn, and a Milburn policeman rides by on a bicycle. And I said, hey, why don't we do that, you know? Oh, come on. Well, we did. Uh, and it took off. So uh, it's become very popular. We've years later, we we shamed the police department in doing the same thing. And they found it to be a very successful program. The then police chief was a former member of ours. So we always, uh, Bob Luce, he actually lives in this town. Um, so uh, we put our first defibrillator in service back in 1992. Um, we used it uh, three months later. Uh, successfully saved the pastor of my parish. Okay. Um, uh, normally, we don't share patient's name, but he came out publicly. And please share. Of course, Tony Boz is no longer with us, but if you remember on Senior Bogdrovitz from St. Teresa's, uh, he was our very first defibrillator save. And we only, they were very expensive. We only had, you know, we only bought one initially and hung on the wall in the bay. And um, I remember when that call went out, I called the building. Uh, and the woman who, who would succeed me as captain the following year picked up the phone. And all I said was, take the defibrillator. Okay? And they did. And it, and it worked. And she called me and she goes, holy, well, holy whatever. It worked. You know. So uh, anyway, after that save, magically, three months later, maybe two months later, we got donations from parishioners, no doubt, to buy two more. So uh, we ne we now own, I think, six of them because every vehicle we have has one. We The bike team has one. We have one hanging in the building. Uh, now you'll find them. The price has come down, right? Anybody remember the very first ballpoint pen was very expensive. Now they're, you know, less than a dollar. So buildings like this, school buildings, shopping centers, there's probably one hanging on the wall someplace. Um, they can be pretty effective. 
Uh, we got some great awards. We were the EMS volunteer EMS agents of the year back in 2000. And then we were also the EMS squad of the year in 2015. Um, so those are nice awards to get. Um, so I always tell everybody, Hey, it's a great opportunity to, to, uh, learn and possibly use valuable life-saving skills. Um, so a little bit about, um, about some, you know, that's enough about the squad. Uh, I also like to do a little bit of, a little bit of public safety announcement for everybody who's here. So the question we also often get is, you know, when should I call for help? You know, I don't want to call 911 and wake people up at three in the morning. Well, somebody woke me up at 2.45 this morning. Um, <clears throat> and then he said, oh, no, please don't call my mom. Don't, 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 worry, don't wake her up. Don't bother. You know, um, so uh, one of my favorite lines is I have a longtime partner I've pulled with. And, you know, he'll, he'll ask, well, how, you know, how are you feeling? Can you describe the pain? You know, did it wake you up from the sleep? You know, oh, and they'll say, oh, well, you know, it's been bothering me for several days. And then, and, you know, Fred will say, well, you know, well, Mr. Dempsey, what was it that, you know, prompted you to dial the ambulance at 3.30 a.m.? You know, you know, try to get that little snide comment in there. Um, but we usually get the right answer, though, you know. Um, so, you know, airway, breathing, and circulation are the three real serious emergencies. So, um as a scientist, you know, I know it's important to breathe. So uh, if someone's having trouble breathing, uh, be it be an allergic reaction, be it, you know, uh, you know, they're, they're overworked, uh, um, you know, uh, maybe an environmental issue, you know, dust in the room, uh, you know, absolutely, you know, seek help. Uh, if we ever, I teach the EMT program, have been for 20 some odd years, uh, member of the faculty of Atlantic Health, and I teach mostly over at Morris Police and Fire Academy. And we tell the students there is if you ever walk into a room and you have more than one person complaining of difficulty breathing. It's the first thing you should do is, you know, think about why am I in this room? Let's get everybody out. OK, um, we have had that happen a couple of times. I once cleared St. Teresa's Church because we had three people inside the church complaining of difficulty breathing. And I asked somebody, I noticed it was the first warm day of the spring. and I noticed and um, has the air conditioner been on all day? And the woman said, oh, it just kicked on as mass started. Uh, got everybody out, you know, fire department came, you know, got all their meters out. Turned out it was, you know, one kid had the flu, two other kids had something else, but it was unrelated. But the fire chief said, no, oh, that was actually the right thing to do because you were thinking, you know, um, <clears throat> that has happened. We did have a case at some high school years ago, seven students in the same room became suddenly ill. Yes, we evacuated the whole building, and uh, turns out there was something wrong. Uh, there was a duct in that room that apparently went right to some uh, utility room, and there was a open solvent in there, and so that was the right thing to do. So anyway, any problems breathing? Uh, any problems with airway? Okay, choking, um, swelling. You know, anaphylactic shock closes the airway. Uh, any problems with circulation? That could mean no pulse or, or very low heart rate or low blood pressure or bleeding. Okay, those are all important, you know, you know, as I, I'll joke with my trauma surgeon friends, you know, all bleeding stops eventually, you know, but uh, we, we want to stop it for the right reasons, right? So, um, and other common medical emergencies, you know, Mitch is going to take out the first aid merit page book and, and fact check me here, but, you know, shock, any state of shock, somebody who's not fully alert and oriented, right? So I always ask people, you know, you know what day it is today, you know where you are, you know. I used to always ask, who's the president? I don't say that anymore. I'll now ask, do you know what year it is? Because, you know, you sometimes, last couple of years, you know, you get, you get some interesting responses out of that. So, um, you know, any kind of poisoning. Poisoning isn't necessarily ingested. It can be inhaled. It can be absorbed through the skin. Yeah. So, um, obviously, any kind of head injury, you know, somebody should get checked out. Um, you know, my x-ray vision isn't working in the field, so we, we'd like to go in and have them get a, an x-ray or, or a CAT scan and make sure everything's okay in that regard. Diabetic emergencies, uh, di you know, diabetes is tough to diagnose. Sometimes the sugar can be off the charts high, and sometimes there's not enough sugar. You know, um, bottom line is if, uh, if you don't have enough sugar, you know, you, you can die. If you have too much sugar, you know, you'll live. You may not be comfortable, but you know, you'll you'll survive. So we always err on the side of giving that glucose versus not uh, when in doubt. Any kind of burns, obviously, uh, you know, a burn might look not too serious now, but over time it can get worse. Um, you know, and that typically happens. Uh, you know, if you ever uh, 
have somebody who's burned, you know, we always want to cool it right away. I always teach people like if, if you're cooking bacon on the stove and you take the frying pan off the stove and you listen, it's still sizzling. Right, because it's still hot. So you want to you remove that heat. So cool it and cover it is always what we do for burns. Uh, obviously, any kind of fracture, you don't want somebody to walk on a on an injury, or even with a broken arm, walk because they're gonna they can do more harm. So we want to have somebody who knows what they're doing and mobilize and get them to a hospital. Um, and any kind of an injury, you know, a fall from a height, you know, above, you know, if you're six feet tall, a fall from a height of above six feet, they should go to the hospital. Okay. Um, you know, obviously, um, what do they say? It's not the fall, it's the sudden stop. That's the problem, right? So, you know, a fall from a significant height onto an unyielding surface, I think is what uh, Dr. DeGrin used to say, if you ever watch that show. Um, you know, car accidents, you know, any kind of an accident where there's any, you know, uh, if the airbag deployed, that's great that they do their jobs. If the person's not wearing their seatbelt in the airbag deployed, they should probably get checked out. If there's any, I always look for damage. If the you know, the windshield, the window, the rear of a mirror is damaged. It probably means, you know, that big bowling ball on top of their shoulders hit it. They should go get checked out. So those are some of the things, you know, when in doubt, if you think, should I call the ambulance? You probably should. Okay. 911 is, is generally the best way to call. Uh, it's best not to email us. A couple of years. I, you know, as PIO, I, I'd get the email to the info at some EMS to org address. And it was about three years ago. Right just before COVID started, I got an email from somebody in Chatham saying, you know, my wife is in labor. Um, you know, I, th I think my wife is in labor, you know, and, and so forth. Could you send the ambulance? You know, I, of course, I read that email about 12 hours later because, you know, we don't read it every, if I was a teenager, I might be reading it every, all the time, but I didn't. And I, I replied back to him, hey, by the way, when, you know, if you're in Chatham, please dial this number, you know, and, and yeah. Uh, and don't do email, call, call, you know, when in doubt, call. Alexander Graham Bell had that great invention. You know, we should use it. That's the best way to uh, request help still today. Okay. I, a lot of Bell Labs guys in here, I think. I have a feeling where we are. Okay. Right. I, my full-time job is with AT&T, which is, uh, so, um, which engineering, engineering, nothing to do with EMS. So why do I do this? I, that's a good question. Maybe I should have been a doctor. Uh, so when you're calling for help, you know, that's very important to make sure the dispatcher knows where you are. We got a lot of calls that someone's calling about their family member. Oh, my mom, you know, lives in Mendham. Can you send the ambulance there? Well, if I dial 911 from New Providence, I'm going to get Mountain Valley Dispatch right, or, right across the street here. I'm not going to get the mom or dad lives, right? Um, or sometimes even out of state. So you don't want to make sure you get the right place. Now, if you don't know, you can call 911 and say, hey, you know, my friend or loved one is in this city and this state. Can you get me there? They will. There's going to be a delay. So if you're in a situation like that, it's best to find the 10-digit the, the number and dial it. Uh, every 911 answering point has a 10-digit number. Uh, if you have an alarm system in your house, you know, burglar, fire, medical, you know, I've, I've fallen, I can't get up pendant. Make sure they, they usually will know, but make sure they have the right number. Um, there are some places that have a summit mailing address that are actually in New Providence or Berkeley Heights. Okay, so um, the Tall Oak section, you know, uh, for example, um, and then the other section just off of Mountain Avenue is actually in Berkeley Heights in Providence. So, you know, make sure you get the, you want to get to the right place. Well, if we get the call, we'll respond until they do, but usually... Um, you want the right people to get the call. Uh, make sure you tell them what's wrong, how many people are injured. Um, are there any hazards? You know, is there smoke? Is there fire? Um, you know, are there, are there gun gunshots? There's a man running around with a knife. You know, th those things they kind of want to know. Uh, uh, is the patient conscious? You know, those, those kinds of things. Uh, I always tell people, make sure you hang up last. You know, um, the dispatcher will tell you when they're done. A lot of people will call, oh, send the ambulance, 121, running me away. Thanks. Hang up the phone. And, you know, and then the dispatcher's like, what? You know, they have to replay the recording and figure out where the call came from. We get an awful lot of calls now don't come from landlines anymore. They come from cell phones. If it's a landline, you know, there's an Annie and an Alley number for you telecom guys out there. So we can tell at least what the billing address is for that phone number. If it's a cell phone, you know, we got a call two years ago. The cell phone number was a San Francisco number. 
the person was someplace in Summit. So we had to call two different places, you know, both Verizon and AT&T to ping the cell phone and figure out where it was because the guy had the street address completely wrong. He was visiting family and somebody in the house was ill and he, this guy didn't live there. He didn't, and, you know, so we finally, we finally found it, but there was definitely a delay in getting there. So that's important. Um, okay. And then until help arrives, a couple of things you can do to make the response easy. Uh, somebody should always stay with the patient. You know, if, if there's more than one person there, somebody stay with the patient, somebody else make the call and then, you know, preferably go outside and meet them. Tom actually met me at the front door today, um, you know, to wave down the ambulance. You know, uh, if you live in a, whether you live in a house, in an apartment, is your house number vis clearly visible from the street? Uh, I can't tell you how many houses we roll up on in the middle of the night, you know, uh, and you can't find the house number. You know, um, or there's one apartment complex where they had sort of brass numbers on sort of a light tan background. You know, you, you, you can shine that, you know, 10,000 can power light on it and try to read it. Uh, and then you're going to wake up everybody in the building, too. Um, and even then, it's hard to read. So that's that's kind of important. Uh, make sure that uh, the numbers are visible. Uh, turn a light on. Um, don't move the patient unless it's absolutely necessary. You know, the room's filling up with smoke. Okay, we can try to do a head first drag. Usually it's better to have, particularly with this group, have two of you do that, you know, rather than one, uh, get them out of the room. But in most cases, leave them be. Don't put yourself in harm's way. We've had a lot, we've had cases over the years, not too many around here, but nationally, where a, a, a well-intended rescuer has become a victim themselves. And now first responders get on the scene. Now that I've got two or three patients to deal with. Um, so it's better just to get out and then you know, make note of where the person is and tell the responders when they get there. Uh, at the fire department arrives, they're going to be wearing breathing apparatus. They can go in and, and get somebody out pretty quick. One of my very first fire calls, I wasn't a fireman yet. I was just on the first aid squad. And um, it was uh, the fire captain, who later became chief, by the way. Uh, he had gone in to get somebody, and he took off his mask and gave it to the guy who he was helping out. So he gets out, you know, the, the, the patient, the victim has the mask on, the, the captain has nothing. And he, and he looked kind of green. I don't feel so well, you know, so he, you know, he was one of my first patients. Um, <clears throat> became a fireman about two months later. Okay. Um, okay. So we talk about meeting him on the street. Uh, a little bit about preparedness. Okay. I have a whole presentation we can give. September is also National Preparedness Month. So, um, there's a whole presentation I can give. It's about an hour long about how we prepare ourselves. Um, there used to be a TV show, uh, I think it was a uh, Nat Geo called Doomsday Preppers, you know, and it was, you know, that was pretty extreme. And some of the, you know, so, you know, if you, and I always tell people that they take that class, you know, if you're looking for to survive the zombie apocalypse, you know, mine is not the class for you, you know, but if you're worried about losing power for two or three days, you know, which does happen around here, you know, uh, or losing water, which happened after Irene, you know, this is probably, the, these are some of the things you should do. So it's, you know, we're not, you know, you, you see some of the disasters around the world, you know, most recently in Hawaii, with that, the huge brush fire. Um, and you've seen the earthquake just last week in Morocco, you know, but if you think, if I think about it, since 2011, right here in New Jersey, uh, in fact, in my town and summit, we've had an earthquake, you know, a super storm, multiple hurricanes, uh, at least one tornado, uh, and at least several, uh, at least three instances I can think of where power was lost for multiple days at a time. So some stuff you should always have on hand. If you have medication, if you take medication, you know, don't let it run out before you run to the drugstore to get more. Always have at least three days medication on hand. So get it filled, you know, several days before it's going to run out. Um, always have at least three days of, you know, non-perishable food and, and water, drink drinkable water on hand, very important. Um, if you have a medical condition, consider an, a, a bracelet or a, or a necklace that says, I am a diabetic or I take anticoagulant drugs or whatever. Uh, that, that's, those are important things to have. Um, <clears throat> make sure there's a clear path in and out of your home. We get a lot of calls where the house looks great from the street and you get inside and, you know, maybe they don't qualify as hoarders, but, you know, they do, uh, 
yeah, I, I guess I'll use the medical term, um, ratus pacus, right? So, um, you know, people have a lot of stuff. And, you know, don't go in my basement because, you know, both my wife's parents have passed. Both my parents have passed. She had an aunt and an uncle who didn't have any kids. So, you know, a lot of that stuff is now in our basement. And we've been, I've been trying to say, we're trying to get rid of some of this stuff, you know. Um, <clears throat> Uh, but that's important. You want to make sure the hallway is passable. The stairway is passable. We have a lot of cases where we're trying to carry somebody out on a stair chair or a stretcher and you can't navigate. Make sure the front door opens all the way. Very important. Um, those kinds of things. Um, slips and falls. Um, we we do a lot of, you know, uh, advice when we're on the scene. You know, if we find that somebody has tripped and fallen, and we we'll take a look around and say, well, you know, you know, this rug is pretty secure. It's not going to break. A lot of throw rugs, you know, um, they're older. If they had a rubber backing, it's worn out, particularly in the bathroom. You know, you can buy that sort of uh, honeycomb or rubber stuff to go underneath it. That helps. Um, or they're bunched up or there's extension cords running underneath or, ex or extension cords or, or network or, or cable TV cords running across the path where you walk. Those are all tripping hazards. Uh, we noticed a lot of these after Sandy when people were without power. And one of the things we noticed was we were getting a lot of more trip and fall calls because it was dark in the house. They might have had some lighting, but not a lot. And they wouldn't see. They would know to step over. But now it's dark. I miss it. And the trip over. And we got a lot more falls because of that. So that's important stuff. Um, Make sure you have a smoke and a carbon monoxide detector uh, and test them. You know, some of the new ones they sell now are, are pretty much idiot proof. They're usually they've got a seven year built in battery. You buy it, you put it in, you know, it'll send you a message when it's time to end of life and you throw it away. Uh, the older ones will have a battery that you have to replace. You know, the generally the fire department will recommend when you change your clocks, change your batteries. Because uh, those batteries typically don't last more than a year. That's important. I have been in wearing my other hat when I was a fireman. Um, I've been in houses where you can see a smoke detector on the ceiling. It had been activated because the battery probably died two years ago. So that happens a lot. So, um, <clears throat> okay, a couple things I'll go over. Um, since yesterday was September 11th, I wanted to talk a little bit about it. Um, one of the slides I had on my other deck was some of the calls, the major incidents we've responded to over the years. I think you know, all the way back in the 60s, there was the, the Babs shop fire. If anybody was around in town at the time, they might remember that one. Uh, that is what is now the Summit Promenade. Uh, when that building completely was gutted, you know, um, uh, there were no people injured now because it happened in the middle of the night, but there were, we treated a number of firefighters before, long before my time. But uh, I, I see the photos. That was probably one of the bigger ones. Uh, there was a what is now one Euclid Avenue. Those condominiums used to be, you know, a luxury apartment building that was built in 1927. That burned to the ground in 1970. Um, <clears throat> and a big, big call for us. Uh, but September 11th was by far the biggest. Um, we had... Uh, I was president of the squad at the time, and I was on my way to work at at and in Middletown, and then driving down the parkway uh, in Cheesequake, I could look to the left and see the tower with the smoke coming out of it. Um, a few minutes later, the second plane hit. So right away, I knew this is not an accident. Uh, never made it inside the building when I got to work. I was, uh, it was funny. I was about to meet my new boss, and I'd just been read into a an SCI program, and I didn't know if they're going to have a lockdown and a skip that won't let me leave. So I tried to call several people to tell them, you know, what was going on. Couldn't get a cell signal through to anybody outside of AT&T's building. Couldn't get a cell signal because all the most of the settlement structure in southern Manhattan was it was knocked out, and everybody and their brother got on the cell phone to call. So as I'm listening. Um, I had called the building a couple of times and I got through to them uh, and they said, yeah, we're nothing, nothing yet. We were standing by. We haven't been told to mobilize yet. Um, so after my last attempt to call somebody inside AT&T, got through a couple of times, but just got voicemail. They were all apparently at the, on the fifth floor of the building where you could see Southern Manhattan. That's why they weren't answering the phone. Um, while my, my radio goes off, you know, CENCOM, all members, 
Summit, Clark, Kenilworth, First Aid Squad. Yeah, that was it, you know, up the parkway. About 20 minutes from Middletown to Summit. Um, I had a police escort for about 10 miles. Uh, and we got back to town. And I was not the chief that year. I was the president. Chief's husband calls me. Don't let her go to New York. Steve. Yeah. So we sent her to the emergency operations center in City Hall. And uh, in the meantime, we put together a big response. We had three ambulances. One with the duty crew was already on an unrelated call. And we loaded up. Actually, we unloaded one ambulance that people had loaded to the gills of the equipment. Uh, and we, we put two crews together to respond to other calls. We borrowed from Paul Vickery, who owned an uh, ambulance company in town at the time. Three other ambulances outfitted them, used them all that day. Uh, we ended up going to the train station because there were reports of people coming back on the trains covered with, you know, whatever. And we wasn't sure. Thinking about when the Trade Center was built, built in the 70s, it's probably a lot of gypsum and concrete dust, but they used asbestos back then. So we decided, you know, we should probably decon these people. So we called over to the EOC and said, hey, you know, we did some training with uh, Novartis, was then Novartis at the time, on the decon. They had this inflatable decon tank. Oh, yeah, yeah, Brent. So we brought that up to the train station. They brought it up, set it up. Uh, we evaluated about 700 patients at the train station. We fully deconned, I think it was 75. I ended, ended up transporting just one to the hospital. Um, we learned a lot that day. You know, we went out and we had, I ended up becoming logistics officer. And we had to get a lot of stuff. You know, we all had white jumpsuits, to, white Tyvek suits to wear for us. But somebody's getting a full decon shower. We've got to give them clothes to wear. So we got more jumpsuits. You know, went down to some hardware, bought out their supply. Somebody who worked for Merck, who was also a member of volunteer squad, you know, uh, got our call, showed up in Garwood's ambulance, which is where he rode, with 150 jumpsuits in it. Perfect. Problem was they were all white. So now I've got my first responders wearing white. And we've got these people wearing white. So the lesson we learned from there was, okay, we're going to buy yellow ones for us <laughs> going forward. And now we're going to use the white ones for the patient so you can tell who's who. And we learned a lot that day. Uh, Summit lost nine people, nine residents that did not come home that night. Um, one of them was uh, one of our members and a good friend of mine, Ian Thompson. So, um, you know, that was, we uh, we always remember September 11th because it's, uh, I guess if you were around in 1941, you remember Pearl Harbor. Well, September 11th is our, this generation's, I guess, Pearl Harbor. So we, I, I hope, you know, it was a great moment for the first aid squad. We had 49 members show up that day anybody who was in in state dropped what they were doing and showed up uh, when the schools were dismissed the junior members showed up we put them to work um as well um you know it was a great time of coming together afterwards but i hope we never have to do it again so anyway so that was september 11th so i won't belabor that point um anybody have any questions they'd like to ask about the first day squad we have a question online my, my cats Thank you for a very informative talk. Um, do you charge for your services? No. Okay. Uh, we do not bill for services, never have. Uh, some squads, they'll use the money to help pay. From, some squads have to pay uh, part per diem people to cover some of their day shifts, and they will bill for service and use that to pay for it. We've been lucky enough. We haven't had to do that, so no, no bill from us. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ron, please come up. Okay, but back back in the old days of when cell phones first came out, AT and T, Verizon, all the companies would collect the old cell phones and have them repurposed to hand out to like battered women who needed emergency services but didn't have. Is there something similar now for uh, seniors? To, to, you know, a similar type of service that old phones or something could be configured for emergencies that they can carry with them? There is. There is. I, I know the uh, the telecom pioneers of America do collect old cell phones. Uh, and there are a couple of places they give them uh, out. And they, they reconfigure them. They can dial 911 and like one or two other numbers. I know like um, battered women's shelters get them. Um, I'm, I'm sure some other groups that can't afford a cell phone can get them. 
um, your, uh, some of the local police departments will collect them as well. I'm not sure if New Providence does, um, but I, I know the telecom pioneers do because I see them every day. And uh, yeah, right. If you want to get one. Oh, okay. Um, I will email Tom or somebody in the group a link of where to get one. Yeah, that's important. Okay, good question. Uh, next question. John, thank you for your very informative presentation. Uh, my question is, after the ambulance has arrived at the scene of the patient or the accident, how do you decide where to take the patient? Good question. So usually uh, it, it's the nearest full service hospital, but not always. It depends on the patient's condition. So for example, if you've had a heart attack or a stroke, best place for you to go is Overlook. Um, there are people who've flown into Overlook and I'm, I don't work for Atlantic Health, but uh, uh, um, you know, adjunct uh, professor for them, but I don't actually work for them. But there are people who've flown into Overlook from out of state because they're the, they're the number one stroke center on the East Coast. Uh, if you've had a traumatic injury, you know, head, neck, back injuries, anything like that, Morristown Medical Center is the best place to go. If you've got burns and there's nothing else that's immediately life-threatening, St. Barnabas is, is the place you'll want to go. Sometimes the patient will have a preference. You know, if we can, we'll, you know, abide by that. Uh, in the middle of the night, if we only have one crew, you know, and they want to go to some hospital 20 miles away, we'll usually say no because, we, you know, that takes our crew out of service for an extra hour. Um, but that's, yeah, so we have, you know, most of our, mostly Overlook and Morristown and St. Barnabas are typically where we go. Um, if it's a psych patient, sometimes they'll go to Trinitas and Elizabeth. Um, you know, there are also satellite ERs. There's one at the old Muhlenberg Hospital in Plainfield, and there's one at uh, the old Union Hospital in Union. We typically don't take ambulance patients there because they can't be admitted. So we'll typically go to those for use. Occasionally, Beth Israel um, in Newark. And if it's a serious trauma, um, we will go to what I call the Knife and Gun Club, which is University Hospital down in Newark. You know, fortunately, we don't get too many of those, but we uh, a serious trauma will go there. Uh, they have, you know, a trauma team in-house ready to go 24-7. And if we bring somebody with a really serious, somebody fell from the height of 20 feet or something, you know, we'll go there and they'll meet us at the door ready to take the patient. So that's that's how we get them. Uh, I have a question. Um, a lot of us have conditions that in an emergency, a doctor should know. You know, it could be an allergy or it could be an implant or something else. Um, what's the best way to carry that information? Is it a bracelet? Is it in your wallet? Is it on your phone? What what do you think is the the best choice? Yes, uh, I would say all of the above. Um, you know, if you live alone, you probably want to have a list someplace. You know, maybe you know on a magnet on the refrigerator door, right? Assuming you don't have a stainless steel fridge, which are not magnetic, which is why I hate stainless steel fridges. You know, but, um, you know, yeah, um, you know, a, a bracelet is going to have minimal information, but at least alert us to something, to alert us to look, you know, a wallet someplace on your phone. Some people will put in their phone, they'll put a, you know, an entry called ICE in case of emergency or something like that. Uh, we can look it up. Uh, there are apps you can put on your phone, you know, if, if you can get into your phone, if you have, if you need a password to get into the phone, I don't have your password, so I'm, I won't be able to get into it. Um, but, you know, in, in a wallet uh, is a good place, um, you know, you, someplace on your person and someplace in your home. Um, we uh, years ago, we gave out something called the vial of life, which was uh, we distributed one back in, I think it was 2002 to every home in Summit. It was a medicine vial with a form in it and a little magnet. Went, and you put you put it in your refrigerator. And it was a magnet on the outside of the fridge. And that way, any first responder could find it. Because, you know, the unconscious patient can't tell us their medical history. You know, if there's somebody else in the home, a uh, family member or friend, they might be able to tell us. Uh, but, you know, if you're out shopping or out at work or whatever, you're, those folks won't know. 
So it's best to have something on your person. Thank you, Paul. Thank you also, John, for a wonderful presentation. I mean, it's just fabulous. And thanks for the work that you, you you do and everybody else. I mean, it is really a blessing for Summit to have people like you around. Um, so, so here's a very practical question. I was th This was actually a conversation I was having with a member the other day because he lives with his wife and his brother, but they're going to be away for a while and he's unstable on his feet, you know, and and so he's concerned about falling when nobody else is there. And I said, well, look, make, make sure you carry your, your phone with you so you can dial 911 if you're stuck on the floor. And I said, you know, think about what happens if the emergency service arrives and they can't get into your house. So, you know, leave a key or something. So, uh, um, or, or leave a key with a neighbor or under a plant, it, the usual things. And anyway, I was just trying to give him sensible advice. But that makes me wonder, what do you do when you arrive at a house and you know that somebody's fallen and the door is locked and you can't get in? Do you rely on your police escort to deal with that? <laughs> Sometimes. It reminds me of another scouting moment. Um, I once had to break into the front door uh, of the man who was uh, the merit badge counselor from my very first merit badge. It was, this is probably now 20 years later. Um, because the fire department was tied up that night. We usually have the fire department come in and, and open it for us if we can't find a way in. Um, or we'll climb in a window or we'll try to do as little damage as possible. That particular night, the whole summit fire department was at a serious house fire, you know, several blocks away. So we knew we weren't going to get anybody. So we, we use our tool and did it ourselves. Funny thing was, um, I had, a, was working at Stevens Miller at the time. I'd actually sold them the lock for that front door. So I told him, come in, we'll give, we'll give you one at cost. Or we give, you know, um, uh, but usually that's what we'll do. You know, typically we'll, um, you know, don't hide a key under your doormat because, you know, the folks know to look for it. You know, the little plastic rocks with the hidden key, they usually know to do that. What you could do is you can, you know, the realtors have something called a lockbox that puts something outside the house. They now sell sort of a personal lockbox you can put on there that has a combination on it. You know, uh, and you can, you know, give the dispatcher the combination, you know, um, which they'll typically tell us to call them so they don't give it over the radio. Because once they give it out over the radio, now you've got to change the combo, you know, because there are people out in scanner land who will hear that. But we do have sometimes where they'll say, oh, you know, they'll tell us, you know, if you go into the garage, there's a key under the red flower pot or, or you know, or inside this cabinet or or the the code for the lockbox is 3572 or something, you know. Uh, so that's a, probably a good idea. There's also, um, certainly if you live in an apartment building, but even if you live in a private home, something called a Knox box. Companies hold Knox and they'll sell you a box. And the key to that box is the same key for everybody in New Providence or everybody in Summit. And the local fire chief gets several copies of the keys and they give them out to their on-duty responders. So um, we can call it, if there's a knox box, I can call fire and they can come and open the knox box and get us in. Uh, there's an EMS version as well for medical, um, not very popular in this area yet, but you know, it, if, it, if, you know, if it does become, we'll, we'll probably carry it on the ambulance. So those are all things to consider, but good point, because if we can't get in, you know, there's going to be a delay. You know, we don't want to do damage. You know, we'll usually look for a window. Um, is a couple of commercial buildings in Summit where there's a second story window that's always left unlocked. And there's some kind of a code on the building so we know where it is. And we, you know, obviously we're not, we don't carry ladders, but the firemen can climb up. You know, I retired as a fireman. I don't like climbing ladders anymore, but, you know, um, <clears throat> they, you know, get in that way. But again, that all takes time. So, uh, you know, some way of uh, a neighbor who has a key, uh, a good place the key is hidden or the combo to your, you know, key locker are probably the best thing to do on our squad building and in every each of our ambulances, we have a key locker in case the keys get lost on scene. You know, every crew chief knows the code and they can go in and get the spare key. So, yeah, and good question. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we don't have any more questions. Tom, please come up. Jan, I'd like to give you this appreciation from the Oregon. I noticed there's an ultra, ultra honor 
Summit was known as the cap ultra capital of the East when the old guard was formed in 1930. I like that too. And we would like to give you the old guard salute. 